Good evening. Good morning, viewers, wherever you are located. Columbia Global Centers warmly welcomes you to the conclusion of our Africa and Africanity webinar series. We'd also like to apologize for starting late. Uh, we had a little um, setback. This has been a three-part series, and we hope our viewers will find value, value in all the diverse topics that have been covered on religion, identity, and education within the African context. Today's lecture is titled Ethics in Higher Education, an African Perspective. This webinar will be recorded and can be accessed on our YouTube page as well as on our website and the videos in the coming week. Some features have been disabled in today's webinar, this being audio and video sharing as well as screen share. You're welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The speaker will answer your questions at the end of the session. I would now like to hand over to our director, Dr. Murugi Durango. Uh, thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience and welcome. Uh, my name is Murugi Dirango. I'm the director of Columbia Global Centers, Nairobi. CGC Nairobi is one of nine centers that have been established by Columbia University across the world to create opportunities for shared learning and to deepen the nature of global dialogue. Today, we are delighted to host the third in a series of lectures on Africa and Africanity to be delivered by Professor Jesse Mogambi, Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Nairobi. These lectures are organized in collaboration with the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, University of Nairobi and Columbia University's Teachers College. Today's lecture is titled Ethics in Higher Education, an African Perspective. The respondent to today's lecture will be Professor Joy D. Proy, a visiting professor of economics and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I would like to note that uh, the bios for our two speakers are available on our website um, and you can review them there so that we can move right on to the talk by Professor Mugambi, uh, which will start now. Karibu, Professor. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for uh, introducing uh, me and also thank you to the Columbia University for uh, this collaboration that we are having. Uh, before I begin this uh, lecture, the uh, third lecture, I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank Columbia University very much uh, because of uh, the soft spot that uh, you have on, on Kenya. I note that um, it was at uh, uh, Columbia University Teachers College, uh, where Professor Ali Mazrui uh, got his master's degree in 1961. Actually, I was in class seven at that time. <laughs> so we have come a long way and I thank you very much, uh, Columbia University, for this collaboration. I also would like to thank the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies uh, for making it possible for, for me to, to share with you in this way. Uh, this uh, third uh, lecture in the series is titled uh, Ethics in, in Higher Education. Um, uh, from the old outset, uh, I'd like to make uh, a conceptual distinction uh, between uh, education, uh, schooling, and training. Um, when I was uh, in primary school, we used to have a, a book uh, to train uh, or, or other to educate us. It was called The Student's Companion. And it had verbs and nouns and adjectives. And we used to use that book to um, set quizzes on ourselves. Who, uh, what do you train? According to the student's companion, you train a dog. Uh, what do you school? You school a horse. So I suppose it's better to be, to be a dog, to be trained rather than to be a horse. I don't know which. Uh, this play on words is very important for us as we think about, uh, about education uh, in, in, in ethics in higher education. And I would like straight away to go to, to the slides uh, so that we can uh, rush quickly. 
and as the, the series of, of, of uh, uh, PowerPoints uh, are screened, I would like to request you to accompany me in asking the questions that we need to all ourselves answer, because I think that is what education is about. So that's, uh, uh, that's the beginning, and I've just made my introduction. Uh, so we can now move on to the first uh, slide. The year 2020 will be remembered for the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which affected every nation globally. And we're still going through it as we go through this third lecture. The internet has made it possible for people across the nations to communicate instantly uh, across and within nations. A little history here. In 1964, a Canadian uh, philosopher called Marshall McLuhan declared that the world had become a global village. This insight at the time was controversial. Today, Marshall McLuhan's insight is taken for granted. This webinar has a global audience, and we thank you very much across the world, wherever you are, for logging in. The COVID-19 pandemic reminds us that we live in a global village both consciously and subconsciously. Globalization has become both a blessing and a curse. A blessing because of the goods and goodies that we enjoy, but also a curse because of the liabilities that ensue. COVID-19 pandemic is one of such liabilities. We cannot opt out of the global village, but we must learn to live together in mutual respect and mutual appreciation. I have just uh, whetted your appetite by asking you perhaps to reflect about these verbs. Schooling uh, is associated with horses to generate power uh, prior to invention. Actually, uh, if you had not thought about it, the internal combustion en engine is rated in horsepower because uh, one horsepower is the energy that a horse could generate in one hour. And uh, we may doubt this, but it's very interesting that we have associated, associated schooling with, uh, with, with horses, but it does, we don't remember where the word came from. The word training according to the student's companion, which we learned in primary school, was associated with dogs. And also these days it's also uh, associated with athletes to get them into perfection through repetitive routines. We also have a word, rehearsing, which is associated with actors uh, in theater and film who practice in order to perfect their presentation to the audience. What then is education? Uh, think and accompany me in sharing these thoughts that education is associate, associated with persons and I've never heard anyone talking about educating uh, dogs or uh, training, uh, 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 I mean, educating dogs or educating horses. Education is associated with persons, formally and informally to ensure responsible citizenship responsible adulthood, responsible conduct. Education has to do much, uh, ha has much more to do with values than with action. In other words, what we do should be informed by the, val the values that we have acquired. Higher education presupposes lower education. That's why we have the word higher there. But it is not possible for anyone to undergo higher education and succeed if the lower levels of education have been successful. And it is at the value level that uh, higher education becomes most important. Most African nations have foreign languages as a medium of teaching and learning in higher education. And some in our continent are even introducing um, and have introduced 
uh, foreign uh, languages in primary school. Ideally, in my view, all education should be conducted in the culture and the language of the learners with foreign languages as additional, um, uh, 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 as additional asset. For many centuries, education in Europe was conducted in Latin, dating from the era of the Roman Empire. In our continent, Kiswahili is now one of the official languages of the African Union. Perhaps before long, maybe not in my lifetime, but hopefully, Kiswahili might become a lingua franca of our continent. And in my view, it is important that that happens because as long as Africa communicates in foreign languages, we cannot really claim to be truly ourselves. A question might be raised on what to do with technical terms. The answer can be found in Tanzania and Rwanda and Burundi, a few countries that have already adopted their own languages, local languages, as the mediums of instruction. They have not failed in uh, uh, perfecting the foreign languages. In the case of Rwanda and Burundi, it is French. It is possible, but these are value uh, decisions that must be made. Religious texts are the earliest artifacts in most cultures. A culture matures when its own scholars translate the scriptures into the national language. On the basis of this criterion, I want to put forward to you, Professor John Beatty, who passed on last year, has become the pioneer through his translation of the New Testament from original Greek into Kekamba, his mother tongue. The most enduring artifacts of culture are those that focus on basic values, including rituals and virtues. African scholars have a duty to document and avail, avail African wisdom within Africa sooner than later. Professor Ngoge Wathiongo has become the first, just like Ngoge, another Kenyan, to deliver an acceptance uh, speech of an award in his own language, Igekoyo. Uh, this happened a few weeks a, a, a few weeks ago in Catalonia. Kenyans of my, genera my generation would be punished in school if they spoke an African language. Uh, just as a footnote here, uh, uh, I was fond of the language. I never was kind. Uh, I was able to speak uh, uh, that language, uh, not because my mother and father spoke it, but because I, I was fascinated by the language we are using now in communication. The purpose was to ensure that we learned to speak and write English fluently, which of course was the imperial language at the time. The routine served the intended purpose. Fortunately, I, I, I still keep, uh, kept the language of my parents and grandparents, uh, who, which I had been taught before I went to school. Uh, we used to sing, maybe I can, I can sing one of those. Make new friends, make new friends, but keep the old one is silver, but the other's gold. One is silver, but the other's gold. Well, this principle in my view remains valid uh, even under the pressures of globalization. Let's keep the friends we make, including the ones we associate with uh, in this series of lectures. The challenge, however, is how parents can entrench African cultural values while globalization is marketed as normative. This continent called Africa got its name from uh, the Roman province called Africa Proconsularis in, in Latin, established by Julius Caesar in uh, 146 BC after conquest and colonization of the entire North African coast. The headquarters of Africa Proconsularis was at Carthage in present day Tunisia. Carthage became one of the prominent centers of Christianity and several church councils were convened there at Carthage. The other African centers were and remain um, in Egypt and in Ethiopia. The rift between North Africa and Roman 
North African and Roman Christianity was debated at Carthage. The African church parted ways with Rome, the former remaining Orthodox and the latter Catholic. And that divide still remains. Professor Ali Mazrui proposed that Africa has a triple heritage, indigenous African, West Asian and European. Mazrui's views take account of relatively recent migrations into Africa from Western Europe and Western Asia. It does not yet appreciate the fact that hominids evolved into humans here in Africa and the majority have remained here in Africa. Recent migrations into Africa were primarily for conquest, extraction and enslavement. Few settlers remained in a few African countries, especially Kenya, Mozambique, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. The wars of liberation, especially in these countries, had to do with the fact that extractive economy had centered on Europe, not on Africa. The founding fathers of the OAU, now African, U African Union, in 1963, was the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. Schooling without education. Yes, some of us uh, have been uh, even beaten uh, to, to memorize texts uh, if we didn't do it right in foreign languages. I belong to the generation of, African, of Africans for whom memorization of texts was key to passing examinations. I won many prizes for memorizing texts. But comprehension uh, is much more important than recitation. When we recited those texts, we didn't care what uh, they meant. Uh, we just had to do it in the accent that was given to us. If I knew how to deliver this lecture, I would have kept all those rubbers and pencils that I kept as, as, as presents, <laughs> but I, I did not keep them. Relevant history. The school curriculum of my generation was loaded with knowledge about other cultures that had little or nothing to do with African identity. Relevant creative authorship uh, is very important. The result was cultural alienation at that time, reflected in novels and fiction by such African authors as Chinua Achebe, Sapren Ekwenzi, Mogo Betty, Okot Bitek, and others. A great deal has changed since then. African nations have endeavored to contextualize learning at all levels. Here, uh, since this is a, a lecture on higher education, I do, I'm not sure that any of you have thought about uh, Africa and how big it is. If you hadn't thought about it, just look at this map. The entire China, the entire India, the entire Eastern Europe, the entire USA with their elections, the entire Eastern Europe, the whole of Spain, France, all those countries can fit in Africa. And there still will be some place for Africans to live. Although we are very many now, 1.4 billion. Having given that, let's look at this also in case you haven't uh, thought about it. There are about 2,000 languages now, uh, uh, more than 2,000 languages into which the Bible is being translated. And I hear that the Muslims are also trying to uh, translate the Quran from Arabic into these languages. But are they really 2,000? Uh, the map we have here is not drawn by me. You can find it on the internet. And it has a list of only six families of languages. Suppose we, 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 we thought this way, rather than fragmenting the continent, and we, were, we had six states, not 55. Uh, it would be, it make a lot of difference. And maybe the younger generation, not us, will look at it that way. The, these six languages are in categories, Afro-Asiatic, uh, that are in blue, nilo saharan which are in yellow, Niger-Congo A, um, which is um, in red, 
uh, taking uh, the, the route all the way from Central Africa to uh, West Africa. Niger Congo B, the Bantu, which is orange, to which I belong together with many others. Khoisan uh, in Southern Africa, uh, which has a click clicking language, and Austronesian at the uh, uh, further uh, where the uh, Afrikaners, uh, they don't like that word, but where Afrikaans is spoken. Uh, if we were to commit ourselves to think about Africa in this way, rather than in the divisive way in which we have been schooled, I think we would make much, much more progress than fragmenting the continent. Um, the African Union uh, in 2013 um, made up uh, uh, what they, they call um, objectives or aims uh, on the African we want. There are six aspirations and they are fairly simple to internalize if only uh, we could appreciate the work that our diplomats have done. A prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, an integrated continent politically un united based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of Africa's renaissance, Three, an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. Four, a peaceful and secure Africa. And five, and this is where I would like to lay emphasis, and I do so in my teaching, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. I think uh, firmly and strongly that this is really what education is about. The others, uh, training and schooling are a different matter altogether. Without the core values, one cannot make it in the long term. Six, an Africa where development is people-driven, unleashing the potential of its women and youth, especially women and youth. And seven, a strong united Africa as an influential player in the globe. In 1960, Marshall McLuhan, I quote again, as I did from the beginning, he wrote, when any new form comes into foreground of things, we naturally look at it through the old stereotypes. We can't help that. This is normal. And we're still, we are still trying to see how um, our previous forms of political and educational patterns persist under television. We are just trying to fit the old things to the new form, instead of asking what is the new form going to do to all the assumptions we had before. That was the quotation. In white, I share this reflection with you. Television is now outdated. The internet has become the norm. That's why we are here from the whole, the whole world communicating instantaneously. The question is how internet will influence higher education globally. I don't have a crystal ball, but I think that in this communication we are having now across the continents is indicative of the potential that we have at our disposal. The topic ethics in higher education challenges us to reflect and act on the basis of an African perspective. Africa is a vast continent with 1.3 billion people third after China and India, but overtaking them before long. The 54 African sovereign nations are members of the African Union and also of the United Nations. Geographically, Africa is the middle continent crossed by the equator and the two uh, tropics. It has, Africa has all types of climate and all, uh, uh, all categories of vegetation zones due to the varied attitudes from zero to nearly 6,000 feet. Six, yeah, 6,000 feet. No, 6,000 meters. Why does Sahara Desert define parts of Africa, including the part of Africa where I come, where I'm broadcasting this? Does the tundra define parts of Europe? 
Does the Atacama Desert define part of America? Does the Mojave Desert uh, uh, define part of North America? Does the Gobi Desert define China? Why define people with reference to a desert? Perhaps a forest would have been more interesting. After all, Africa has the largest forest in the world. Why define people by a desert? This is not a com complaint, a food for thought. And I have told my friends, including you, if you say that I come from sub-Sahara Africa, I will say you come from sub-Tundra Europe or sub-Tundra America. Uh, it doesn't sound nice, does it? Well, it's not it for that. Um, principles, we need principles to inform our thought and action in higher education. I have a list of 10 here, maybe there are more. One of them is the value of accountability. Humans need mutual concern and mutual accountability. Two, adaptation. We, we need to change when change demands it. And if we don't choose to change, change will change us. Care. We need to care for one another to enhance the survival of the species. Humans are one of the weakest and most vulnerable of the mammals. And without caring for one another, our future is doomed. The gestation period of, of the human is very long and the nurturing of the infant to childhood, to adulthood, to, uh, to, to, to um, adolescence and adulthood is very long. So we need to care for one another. Cooperation, we need to share burdens to ease carrying the load. We need to mitigate. When change comes, we must compensate. And I suppose that COVID-19 is one of those challenges uh, that we must face. Precaution, prevention is better than cure. Responsibility, each of us has a vital role individ as an individual to play. Support, mutual support ensures community well-being. Transparency is very important. Disclosure ensures faster treatment and faster response. And welfare, life in community enhances well-being. Uh, higher education, what for? Why? Well, I try to put my thoughts together and share with you. And I have six points here for us to reflect about. One, to make sense of our existence individually and institutionally. Two, to modify our environment for a more comfortable living. And on this point, it seems to me that instead of improving our environment, we are destroying it and future generations are going to pay very dearly for it. Mahatma Gandhi reminds us, there is enough for needs of all people, not enough for one person's greed. Four, ideally, higher education in every culture ought to focus on this challenge by Gandhi. If not, higher education risks negating the ideals of human coexistence. And five, Higher education in Africa is still foreign ref referred and foreign referenced. It must become internally moderated and innovated. Six, the seven aspirations of the African Union summarize the basis for education policy and planning across the entire African Union. Uh, Africa has negatively been viewed by others. Such negativity is in textbooks, it is in novels, it in, is in films, in pop songs, the labels, Sub-Sahara Africa, Primitive Africa, Pagan Africa, all these betray prejudice and condescendence, hindering mutual respect and mutual appreciation. We should use labels that are neutral, that are descriptive, not discriminatory. And I've suggested, for example, 
if it is tropical Africa, yeah, uh, that makes sense because yeah, indeed we live on the tropics. Uh, and those who live in temperate Africa, in South Af Southern Africa, with Mediterranean climate, in Northern Africa, that is descriptive. But these other labels are, in my view, uh, insults. Black and white are used for labeling people, but I put it to ourselves, I haven't really seen black people. I have seen pink ones and brown ones. And those who are very black in Africa are near purple, unless I'm colorblind, those are the Sudanese. So this division between black and white um, is, uh, is ideological and it is not polite. We seem to be colorblind. Maybe we should use pink and brown, brown if you're not colorblind. Is color a proper way of categorizing people? I think not. Why not nationality? Minitries, varieties, military varieties and one forest. I think global higher education is like a natural forest, not like a plantation. There are many trees in the, in the global cultural forest, germinating from cultural seeds in the soil of each culture. The roots of education are the cultures of the learners and the educators. African higher, edu African higher education today is like this, the science grafted from abroad on local African cultural seedlings. The consequence is cultural fusion, confusion and illusion. Fusion works many ways towards the West, the East or North Africa. Confusion leads nowhere. Illusion use frustra uh, uh, frustration. I am one of the witnesses of hope that working together, we shall not fail. We shall prevail and we shall overcome. After all, this webinar has been made possible. If, if Marshall McLuhan were to wake up today, I think he would laugh, he would not just smile. Religions and ideologies have been competing for African souls instead of cooperating for mutual understanding and mutual respect. There is bizarre self-congratulation about how many African souls have been converted into various brands of religion and ideology. Schooling has been the tool for cultural indoctrination, both religious and secular. Tertiary education in Africa is plagued with ethical confusion burdened with missionary and ideological propaganda. In this third millennium, Africa has a, her own agenda to shape the present and the future. Africa in the past influenced other cultures. Africa will in future influence other cultures again. The process has already begun. If not with this webinar, with you, the audience. Okay. Connectivity for digitization and internet is lowest in Africa. At the same time, Africa has the youngest median age globally of 19.2. Some countries have a, a median age in the 50s. I don't know what COVID-19 is going to leave behind. Thus, African youth are at least serv serviced for online connectivity, are the least serviced for online connectivity or internet is practically indispensable. Global digital divide should be rectified soonest. The fifth, fifth generation 5G digital connectivity should be affordably available, available to Africa soonest. Africa should never be left behind again. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the great potential available for reconstructive social transformation in Africa. Cooperation is much more fulfilling than competition. I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mugambi. Uh, I'm sure our audience have enjoyed the lecture and have learned quite a bit, uh, and I'm sure they have several questions. If you have any questions, I request that you write them in the Q&A or the chat box uh, that is available to you. Um, let me now introduce our respondent, Professor Joydeep Roy. Professor Roy is a visiting professor of economics and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. 
in the Department of Education Policy and Social Analysis, where he teaches courses on the economics of higher education and advises masters and doctoral students. He's also a senior economist at New York City Independent Budget Office, focusing on education and educational policy involving New York City public schools. Um, I will now invite Professor Roy and also note that you can find his uh, expanded bio on our website. Welcome, Professor Roy. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. And it is almost uh, like a privilege hearing from Professor Mugambi. And thanks to everybody for organizing this uh, webinar and for coming here. Uh, so I, I cannot say how much I enjoyed actually like enjoyment is not a good word i should say learn and really appreciate uh, like all the thoughts that professor mukambi has put forward I, I think that it would be really good to like share your slides so that not only who are here personally can benefit but also everybody uh, can really know and learn from what you have been talking about uh, I, I just want to share a few thoughts and i I, I want to say at the outset that my views on this is colored from my straddling two walls, like from my from my birth till when I was 25 years old. Uh, I was in India, like born and brought up uh, in, in like Calcutta, now Kolkata. And I went to Delhi for my like higher education. And then when I was 25 years old, I came to the US. Uh, for my PhD, and after that, I have been working here, and now I teach. I've been teaching at Columbia Teachers College for the last ten years. Uh, so, because of this, my experience has been colored by both the, like what you can call the third world and the first world, and I I believe it gives me a unique perspective. Uh, but some of the things that Professor Mugambi was mentioning uh, was like really struck a. God in terms of my experience. And let me briefly narrate a bit of my life, life experience, and then I will go to a broader issues. So for example, when I was growing up in the 1980s, like when I was a, uh, like an elementary secondary school kid, uh, in my part of India, which is Bengal, it's actually like called West Bengal because the, the Eastern part became part of, like is Bangladesh and the Western part uh, due to religious reasons, like the Western part was mostly uh, Muslims and the Eastern part was Hindu. So the Eastern part remained in India. So in my, in my state, uh, there was a movement in, in, in the late 1970s, uh, the communists came to power in, in West Bengal and they were really concerned with access and equity. Basically at the time in, in, in West Bengal and also in India, like dropout rates were really high, particularly in the rural areas. So when the communists came, they tried to do something about it. And one of the, one of the policies that they implemented in the beginning, beginning from 1983, right after I had uh, like graduated from elementary school, they abolished the teaching of English in elementary schools. So India, like as most like original, like British colonies, uh, it had a very, like I would say British inspired curriculum and even hierarchy of institutions. So basically when I went to school, like even we learned English from first grade, even kindergarten. And that was the, that was the curriculum, that was the system. When the communists came to power, they thought that because particularly like this was before internet, this was actually almost before TV. It was radio and newspaper in, in 1980s. And at the time, like kids in, in the rural areas did not have any exposure to English. And the communists thought that that was really a, that was really something that was holding up like poor, like low income kids in rural areas. They were dropping out uh, and not completing even like elementary schooling. So they abolished the, like English from elementary schools in 1983. This, this, turned out not to be a popular policy. So there were actually like lots of divisions within them. Uh, they revisited it over the years. And in 1997, they went back and reintroduced English from grade one. Uh, I used the example to like basically reflect a little bit on, on Professor Mugambi's 
like words and thoughts in terms of because this i think addresses like or rather like leads to uh, a lot of the question that he was asking in the sense that on the one hand we are really interconnected and and the concern in, in like in my part of like uh, in my state west bengal was that it's true that once you abolish english you gain in terms of access and equity because students particularly rural kids now do not have to master a foreign language a language which they never encountered in real life uh, not even so much in radio or newspaper and, and this was something that earlier was hoisted upon them and you take that up you increase the scope for their learning their progressing schooling on the other hand the 1990s was the beginning of liberalization in india the economy opened up everything became like it was suddenly like a giant leap and then people became concerned that if you don't teach them english from an early age they will be hampered in their job prospects later and then education you know it was very interesting listening to professor mugambi because he was really trying to distinguish among what are the goals of education what do we mean by schooling like like i and i and really find it instructive that he went over all the uh, like the different different cons like the different words that we use for schooling like uh, training schooling <laughs> excuse me uh, uh, like particularly like rehearsing practicing uh, all of these things and i think this is really instructive in terms of like how we think about schooling like what is education like education must be something broader then rehearsing practicing even schooling like schooling is more of the formal act of going to school and completing a curriculum uh, and i must say that we have our we have had our fair share of memorizing things i still remember like a lot of things like we had two subjects like we call them history and geography like in the us they call them social studies and they are basically fuse together but when we were growing up in india we call them history and geography and both of these were really a lot of memorizing uh, i i still feel fortunate because a lot of my knowledge and uh, like really my exposure to the world at large was based on my uh, because i love history and geography basically learning about other cultures other people other places uh, i must say that it was history was very eurocentric so we learned like in class in grade in grade 5 we learned about the ancient history in grade 6 we learned about medieval history and in grade 7 we learned about modern history and it was very eurocentric in the sense that everything was defined on the european civilization so for example the ancient world came to an end in 476 ad with the fall of rome and the medieval world came to an end in 1453 with the fall of constantinople and then it was the renaissance and the modern wall so everything was with respect to the important dates in european history and nothing to do with uh, like either african history uh, or even like what we now know like south america they had a rich history like the uh, we certainly not, did not learn anything about the mayas or the incas or the aztecs and we actually did not learn much about like the rich culture of east asia like the chinese and the japanese and the koreans and southeast asia they all had very rich histories we certainly did not learn anything about them so schooling was very eurocentric uh, so that's like part of my digression about my like personal experience but i wanted to uh, like uh, really underline some of the things that professor mogambi was talking about in the sense that education i i do not know so much about the current stage of elementary and secondary education in the in in, in west bengal but the thing is that they tried experimenting with abolishing english uh, like the, as the, as a language uh, in, in elementary schooling and then they rolled it back even the even the communists who were at the time were supposedly the most like left leaning the most people who were who you would thought of helping the most disadvantaged the most impoverished people even they realized that it might not work in a globalized in an interconnected world uh, because they might be like sort of disadvantaging the particularly they were very worried about the best and brightest students within like rural areas within low income 
and what they were doing to it. Uh, so this was really instructive. And I think that the broader, uh, the, the broader things that Professor Mugambi was talking about are really relevant in terms of what we mean by education. Uh, so let me just uh, quickly go over to some of my own like thoughts or musings and I, uh, let me briefly share my screen. Uh, I, I have just jotted down some notes and I, I basically want to post these as things, as like questions. These are really all open-ended. I don't have an answer, but I just wanted to like think about and debate. So like right now, and I want to basically approach it from the point of view of higher education, like higher education in the global world. So just what it means, like Professor Mohambi was uh, talking about like global village, the concept is not new. It has been around for 50 years. Uh, at the same time, it has taken on, I would say a new urgency or a new, almost a new meaning in today's like interconnected world. And, and that is what my second point is. We not only live in a global world, but also a world increasingly reliant on technology, uh, like not only technology in a manufacturing sense, like earlier in like there were uh, concerns about like labor saving technology, about like uh, uh, what, whether the like euro center technologies are appropriate for like labor surplus countries like India and China and Africa. Uh, but then we talked about technology in, in a more labor, uh, in a more manufacturing sort of way. But today we are talking about like technology in the sense of information technology or IT, uh, like in a world we live online now. Uh, so, and, and this brings me to the point. So what we have seen and what I really feel has happened over the last 10, 15 years, particularly, and I speak from more of an like an US perspective, is what we find in the context of higher education in the US, it, it is that like all, all questions about higher education, including questions about access, equity, and efficiency, they have become increasingly entwined with the question of the labor market. So right now, it's not only really about quote unquote educating a child or educating a, like a teenager, educating and like young adult. It has, the question is, what can we do to have that adult enjoy success in the labor market? And, and this is a really sort of troublesome point in the sense of like, when we talk about education, we try to look upon education in a more broad or holistic sense. Like education is something that fulfills your potential as a human being. Like certainly higher education, we look upon it as something which is, we, it is an aspirational goal. We strive towards it and it should really help in fulfilling your potential. Uh, I, I think that like the, uh, for example, the three things that uh, Professor Mugambi was talking about. Uh, I think he was talking about like responsible citizenship, responsible adulthood and responsible contact. And I think those are really very important to keep in mind that when we are talking about like often when we talk about schooling, it's like, like finishing one level and going on to the next level and all about it. Particularly in the context of US, it has become all about like which college you go to, what type of major you like specialize in, and then what occupation you choose. So higher education has become increasingly like sort of tied up with this question of labor market success. And, and that has some people really uh, like really worried because uh, like we certainly do not know whether that should be the goal. Uh, as to what we think of higher education, particularly from a public policy point of view. Uh, in the sense of like higher education, we are also sort of in a, in a transitional phase. Uh, I say we are in a transitional phase because we don't know what will be the skills of the future. Uh, like in the, in the OECD countries, particularly even in like a lot, so a lot of the emerging countries and the newly industrializing countries, there is always uh, an emphasis on STEM skills like science, technology, engineering, and manufacturing. It is believed that if you go and do STEM in college, you make your life. And if you do anything else, then you might be doomed. 
And we want to like, I like to point out that it's not universally true. We have a lot of new research that says that interpersonal skills, social skills are at least as important in today's like uh, in today's workplace, in today's labor market is not only cognitive skills. Technology, particularly like online technology and it's like is spread, is dispersion all over the like uh, all over over all aspects of our lives. It has impacted both extremes of the earnings occupation distribution. So uh, earlier we thought about, it was in terms of like uh, machines, they will be displacing uh, like uh, typically low skilled workers. There was the concern what would happen to them. But at the same time today, we are not only talking about automation, uh, which might disproportionately affect one end of the of the like the earnings distribution, but we are also increasingly talking about artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence has the opposite has the potential for the opposite impact. It might even displace people who are relatively like uh, who have all these STEM skills because every day our computers are getting more sophisticated, our robots are getting more sophisticated, and they can take over more and more of the jobs. Uh, so in other words, technology might impact both extremes of the earnings occupation distribution. And I mentioned this because I think it's, a, it's one way to underline the fact that if we become too reliant on the, on the higher education just to provide us with narrowly focused skills, uh, then there is a real problem that uh, we are not really we are not really learning the skills of the future because we don't know the jobs of the future. Uh, we don't know really the skills of the future. So it's all the more important that we talk about a comprehensive education in terms of like what are the goals, like what helps you in terms of living your life, enjoying your potential, particularly in like I, I really like the way uh, Professor Mugambi talked about the environment because we not only live in an interconnected world, but an in interconnected world where environment is very important, like how we take care of the environment, how do we live in a sustainable way, how do we live in a way that tomorrow's world is better than today's world. I think these questions are very important and I think that we should really like higher education to be the to be the platform of the forum where people raise these questions and talk about these questions. Uh, in terms of Africa, you know, I, I knew that, but you know, it was really brought home to me when uh, Professor mentioned that like Africa has the least median age globally, and that's a very young population. And, and so like when we think of a young population, we think of their educational needs and, and their potential, but we also think of the huge, huge potential that these people have in, tomorrow, in shaping tomorrow's world. So Africa, uh, like right now, a, a lot of like, uh, Africa has become really prominent over the last, I, I would say one or two decades because uh, like uh, of, all the, of all the things that has been happening, we certainly like get to know more about Africa. We get exposed to more news about Africa. Uh, and so I think that like, uh, the path that Africa chooses as whether as the African Union, whether as the as individual nations working like together with each other uh, as sovereigns, I, I think it will be really interesting. Like I, I, I actually did not know the professor talked about the particular language of the African Union. I was not aware of it, but, but I think that it's a, it's a really interesting and, and probably welcome idea in terms of how you foster like friendship and solidarity within within the African nations and, and how we use that in order to move forward. Uh, like, I, I would just like highlight a couple of other questions. Like, I, I think I have talked about how we think of higher education as opposed to what Professor Mugambi said was like lower education. This will be really important. Like, what does higher education do? What does higher education do for you individually, and what does higher education does for the society? What does higher education does for the economy? So I think these are really relevant questions. And what the like the today's theme is about ethics, and I think that ethics is not only in terms of like I think when I think of ethics, I go back to 
like maybe 2000 years ago, like the time of Aristotle and like, I mean, I know that that's Eurocentric, but at the same time, like Aristotle really like posed some interesting questions in terms of like what makes a man and he was talking about the different types of ethics. So I think that's a really like important and really invaluable point. Uh, I also want to us to think about more like what do we mean by contextualizing education? Like how can we ensure that education remains rooted in local context? And by local, it does not have to be a very like sort of like very uh, very local. It can be the it can be the state, it can be the province, it can be the county, it can be the country. But still, we want to ensure that people keep that sense of belonging, which I think is really important. That you are like even though we always think of ourselves as global citizens and we can be like right now like i am from like speaking from new york and it's like nine o'clock in the morning and most of the other people are probably in kenya where probably it's like 5 15 in the afternoon but we see each other we speak to each other and hopefully we connect with each other and we want to keep that going at the same time we also want to be rooted to our individual cultures, our upbringing, we want to keep uh, the most, like the really the beneficial, the most important aspects of it. Uh, so I want to want us to think about it. The last two questions I will just say is that what's the role for global universities? Like I, I, I know that like Pauline was talking about like uh, Columbia and, and she was grateful to Columbia and Teachers College in terms of making it possible. And I'd like to ask to explore more about like what can be global universities, like particularly the universities which have the resources to invest uh, in, in understanding like cross national, cross continent cooperation, like understanding and, and what will be the role of education. Lastly, I think that this is more in terms of a, like a cautionary tale because we live in a very interconnected world. A lot of things depend on like earlier in higher education, we always would look up as to what will Harvard do because what Harvard does would really impact in terms of what like the rest of the US colleges do. For example, if Harvard today were to publish a lot of its courses online and make them available for free, that would really change the structure of higher education in the US. So earlier, we, we always wanted to know what will Harvard do. And now we often ask about what will Amazon do. And, and just right now, there are lots of like, there are some articles I would be happy to share with them in terms of what will Amazon do. So for example, will Amazon come up with a college? Will Amazon is like is setting up lots of things? Will Amazon set up a college, a university? Will it set up an international university where you go to Amazon and you just do a like a one year, two year training in a narrow curriculum and thereby you get certified. And, and then that's, is that what we will call higher education? Let me stop there and I will be happy to take questions. But again, I want to reiterate that it has been a privilege taking part and just, you know, just listening to people's, like the professor's thoughts and I will be happy to, hear other people's thoughts and questions and answers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Joy Deep. Um, if I could kindly ask you to stop sharing. The, yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so we have a number of questions uh, that we have there. Uh, I'll uh, first uh, allow Professor Mugambi because you've been looking at the questions. Do you see any that you'd like to address uh, right now? Yes. Um... The, the phrase um, globalization is, uh, has, uh, has now become normative. And the, uh, we, we must uh, ask ourselves um, uh, about the verb out of which uh, the noun is taken. What does it mean to globalize? Who globalizes who? And what does globalization mean? And um, it does seem to me that if we accept uh, as normative and as common sense that uh, the world is not flat, that it is a sphere. On a sphere, every place is a center. So 
uh, in this webinar we are having, everyone is uh, in the center, at the center of the world from their perspective. We are all centers where, where we are. The problem uh, is that uh, in uh, ideological discourse, it seems as if uh, the center is elsewhere and globalization means incorporating everyone uh, from the pers that perspective. I would wish that we would interrogate uh, that we would uh, interrogate that uh, uh, that 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 discourse about globalization, and this series uh, that I've been uh, pri privileged to, to to deliver through uh, Columbia uh, Global Center in Nairobi uh, has enabled me to see even more clearly uh, what I'm convinced about, and I'm convinced that since now we know that the world is not flat. It is a sphere. Every place is a center. And that means that if we are serious about that notion, then we have to design education in such a way that um, every, 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 every person, every nation, every point on earth can be heard without a, a hierarchical uh, system. As it is now, it is as if Africa is globalized by everybody else and Africa does not globalize anybody except in athletics where Kenya takes all the, all the medals in long distance. At least we are globalizing the world in, in, in long distance running. Um, but uh, there is room for, for, for us to influence each other. That's, that's the point I want to, to make. And I think that in a discourse, in discussion like this and others that follow, we can cultivate a way of looking at education in which uh, voices can be heard without uh, making them hierarchical. Thank you very much, Professor Mugambi. I know Professor Joy Deep has to leave very shortly, but uh, uh, just before you go, uh, could I no, ask I'm, you I'm, to... I, uh -huh. I actually can, I can stay till 9.45, so I'm okay. good. Okay, that's good, that's good. Um, uh, you know, there's a question here from T Titanji who is asking, how do we remedy the situation or the confusion prevailing in African higher education? What do you think can be the action strategy to start to address the shortcomings you have, uh, Professor Mugambi has described? Can a curriculum review leading into creation of an African higher education area be part of the solution? For Professor Joy Deep, I, I was wondering, uh, let me add to that question. Uh, for you coming from the Asian perspective, Indian perspective, uh, we know higher education is really, um, you know, at a, at a very different level compared to the African region. And, uh, you know, higher education is supposed to address the questions and the challenges of society. Right now, as we look at the COVID situation, for example, um, I don't know how many universities or how many research labs on the African continent are on uh, the verge of developing a vaccine. But we know our vaccine is being developed almost by many other universities across the world uh, are involved. Uh, where are African universities uh, when it comes to challenges such as climate change? Um, so what are some of the lessons that we can learn, if there are any, uh, African institutions from the Asian experience of you know, places like China and, and India and so on, as far as higher education is concerned? Uh, so, so that's a really like important and interesting question. Uh, like my, I, I must admit I don't have as good uh, like a first-hand experience of the Indian like higher education market in recent years as I should have. But I, I, I will just touch on a couple of points. So, what we is is to call brain drain. Uh, that was really very important. That was very important because what like I saw with like a, a lot of students from my cohort and my earlier cohorts was because of the opportunities in the US and because like top elite universities in the US, they were very open uh, to attracting like top talent from, from Asian countries in particular. Uh, and they, they particular like like India was always a good target because generally speaking, because of like the British heritage, Indian students are supposed to have a good mastery of English. Uh, 
so the so Indian students had a relatively easy access to top UK and US universities. And this resulted in, in some sort of brain drain that has been sort of reversing over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, at the same time, this is something that will take even longer uh, to, fully, to fully reverse itself. So right now they have opened up a lot of like a lot of like selective private universities in India. There's a lot of like top companies and stuff like that. At the same time, what my personal experience, particularly with respect to that, like you mentioned the discovery of the COVID vaccine. And I think it, it, is, it is a very telling example that most of the work is being done in the US and the UK, even though the work in many places, like in the US, there were stories about how the vaccine uh, how the COVID vaccine, like in, in one of the companies, I forget whether it was like Pfizer or Moderna, but in one of the cases, it was, even though it was developed in the US, it was primarily being developed by immigrants. So it's not like native born US scientists who were involved, but it was, they, they were involved, of course, but it was more the efforts of like, uh, basically like foreign, foreign born immigrants to the US. And, and so, and, and that goes to, to highlight this point that we live in an interconnected world and because of that like some places like the us they have a significant head start because they started out with the top colleges universities they have the resources they can attract talent and they are continuing to build on that whereas countries like india which which came later like let's say from the 1990s they are still not at that at that same stage where they can compete. So I know that they also had some vaccine, like uh, they had vaccine trials and they're trying to develop, but they certainly do not have the resources comparable to the US, particularly with, with respect to COVID vaccine. I think the government uh, came and, and tried and subsidized them to a great extent. So basically for COVID, it was slightly different because the government, like the US federal government came and said that uh, you don't have to bear any risks, even though you fail, we will cover all the costs of like experimentation and stuff like that. So all the, all the pharmaceutical companies went straight ahead. In terms of like where India is right now, it's really trying to build up on its on its universities and its institutions. Uh, there is a certain difference between the organization institutions, which are more, I would say, market oriented. For example, like my cousin, like I did my PhD in economics and my cousin did his PhD on chemistry. He had many more job opportunities in India and he's now in India. And basically like he lives in my, like in Calcutta, in, in Kolkata, my uh, native place. Whereas for me, there were not as many opportunities uh, because social sciences, certainly humanities, they are still very much neglected. If you want to be a like, like social scientist, like an economic, like economic is probably slightly better compared to the other humanities and social sciences. But the at the end of the day, there are not that many opportunities, even though things are improving. I think that going forward, it will be really really interesting to see whether they are able to like like what's the time frame in which they see like the top indian universities they see themselves as competing with the top us or uk universities but the time lag is very significant even today when i sometimes look at the like uh, times ranking of the top 100 top 200 universities there are very few from india probably only a handful there are more from China, but even not that much. Higher education today, even today, higher education is increasingly dominated in terms of those rankings by all European, like European and US universities. And I, I think that that's, that's something that creates a certain roadblock more in our minds in terms of like what makes a good university. And I, 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 I really like you, Professor Mugambi, to dwell more on this in terms of what, what makes a good university, like what is the purpose of higher education? Like in the US, everything boils down to your like job market success. Like in the US, like Columbia is a good law school because Columbia law graduates have been 
uh, justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. So everything is linked to their eventual success in the labor market and in life. And sometimes I think what we discount is like, is this value of citizenship, this is value of contact, like what did you do with your education? And, and this is also very telling because I, I teach higher education. You see in the U.S. and you see increasingly the OECD countries, 50% of people say that they are not applying their skills that they learned in college in their work. There is a big disconnect between what the skills they learned at college and whether they are applying it. So I think like going back to like what Professor Mukambi was saying, there is really a big scope in terms of overhauling like the curriculum, the structure, the organization of higher education. And I, I really like I ended my point talking about how like how big companies can come in. And that's one of my main concerns, like particularly like, you know, one, one thing that struck me during this year of COVID was that particularly looking at the US, but also in like India and other countries, in terms of like elementary and secondary education, they did not like online education at all. The consensus is that online education at the elementary and secondary level is a failure. You want to have kids in school, in person learn. But the colleges were pretty, pretty happy with online learning. Like a lot of the colleges in the US and announced pretty early that they want to go online. Right now we are going online for the spring. Colleges were pretty happy going online. And I think that if that trend continues, there will be a lot of potential for companies like Amazon or other like multinational, like for-profit companies to come in and just have universities catering to credentials or like diplomas, certificates, we just point to your labor market. You don't need to know anything about being a good person, about caring about your environment, about your society. You just need to show that you know how to, how to calculate. Thank you, Professor Roy, for those insightful comments and thoughts. Um, Professor Mugambi, would you like to handle the rest of the Q&A? questions. Yes. We have a question from Donna, Paul, and others. Yes, let me, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Jodip, for, for, for those remarks. They're, they're very, very insightful. Um, it's the conversation just beginning. I hope we can continue to, to, to exchange. Um, I'll try to be concise and precise so that uh, if there's another round, we can, can go through it. The first question is from uh, Donna. Uh, uh, Donna Pido, and uh, we have already communicated before before this uh, this lecture. Uh, the question where we where I got this idea of training training dogs and uh, schooling horses, um, it comes from uh, a, a book that is available at the textbook center. Uh, it's uh, by a uh, European. I think his first name is West. And um, it has uh, it, it, it helped us when we were uh, when, when we were in, in primary school to learn about uh, European, particularly British, particularly English culture. And so there's one page uh, which is uh, about verbs. And what struck me there are very many verbs there, but the one that struck me most mo 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 most uh, mo most clearly in those days was. Uh, uh, what do you train? You train a dog. What do you school? You school a horse. And so it would seem to me that if, I to, if training is so important, uh, then I'd rather be a dog because, uh, you know, uh, we see how dogs are trained. They're even beaten sometimes in order to do the right thing or they're denying food. I think education is uh, much more than anything else about imparting and consolidating values and attitudes. It won't matter how, how much drilling you do and how much practice is done to do whatever skills that you, you, are, you are imparting. If people don't value them, well, they'll do them when you are, when you are watching, when you're supervising, but when you leave, they do, they do what they like. And we see this uh, in our society all the time. We have people who, who, who are very, very highly qualified in various professions but there's no value basis for, for, for it. And uh, 
So we, 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 are, we are in a very serious mess in terms of uh, national identity, despite the fact that uh, our institutions of higher, higher learning actually have been, uh, have, have turned out a very large uh, cohort of, uh, of trainees, including my own university, University of Nairobi. So uh, yes, you can get that, uh, that book, Student Companion, and uh, it, it has much more than uh, what I've indicated here. In fact, those three, three verbs, uh, schooling, training, and, and so on, are only a few in a, in a whole chapter of, of, of that book. But the purpose of the book was to, try to, to, was to, to induct us as, as children to think English, not just British, to think English. But we have to inculcate values that help us to uh, consolidate uh, our, our values as Africans, but at the same time as global citizens, not specifically British or American and so on, because the world has become a global village, as uh, uh, McLuhan uh, remind, reminded us. There was an, an, another uh, question here uh, from Kamau uh, about uh, indoctrination uh, from religious, uh, uh, from religions coming from outside. I think we should broaden this because it's not only religions, but it's also ideologies. And it is the case that even when, when you talk about religions, that is too broad because Islam comes here with its sects and Christianity comes with its denominations and sects. And from that perspective, they are not just religions, they are actually ideologies because religion very often is co-opted to promote particular uh, agenda. My view of this would, would be, yes, indeed, in our country, uh, and I hope that uh, in the continent you'll be the same, there should be freedom uh, of ex exposure. But uh, that exposure uh, should be informed by a value system which enables the, 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 the person from very early to discriminate between those ideologies and those, uh, those, those religions and those sects. And I don't think it is difficult to do that if we know uh, who we want to be as humans. Here, I want to give an illustration, uh, which I think will relate even to the, 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 the other question I have answered above. The Scandinavian countries, uh, I have had the privilege of visiting there and uh, teaching there, and I have friends from, from, from there, each of the, each of the uh, Nordic countries. Their, their inculcation of values starts very, very early. And one of the things that puzzled me, uh, puzzles me every time I go there, is how people who live next to the North Pole, a place that is so cold, that they can enjoy living there. It puzzles me. We who are on the equator, we don't know what it means to live in cold, but they've been socialized and uh, cultured in such a way that they enjoy that environment. And surprisingly, uh, those uh, people actually export from those economies. Much of the paper comes from there. Uh, the pack, packaged milk came from uh, Denmark. I understand that Tetra Pak came, came actually from Denmark. We would have been the ones doing that, uh, I would have thought, but we didn't. So in, internalizing and appreciating where we have been placed at birth or through migration is extremely important. And so value, value internalization, I think is what education should be about. The rest are skills that can be acquired. But if we acquire quick skills, but we have no values, uh, we just destroy um, if we wish to destroy. The chances of us using our skills uh, responsibly uh, are enhanced greatly if the value system is entrenched as a core. The uh, issue about um, uh, from Kamau about religious and, and ideologies, I would say, Yes, freedom of, of religion and freedom of thought is, is important. But again, from very early, it is important that young people from very, very early are, uh, are inculcated to appreciate, to discriminate. It is not every, uh, uh, it's not every item that glitters is gold. 
And this, uh, these ideologies that uh, pedal to us through television, through radio, through everywhere, we cannot shut them down because the internet is with us. But we have to enable, especially those who are growing up, to discriminate very early through a value system to decide what is beneficial and what is not. The final one um, is about um, uh, uh, from Kamau uh, about local languages and, and how one should handle them. I think, uh, as I have uh, indicated, I, I, I don't think that uh, the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries have are the panacea, but they, they teach us that it is actually possible to belong to the big, the greater whole while you still belong to yourself. They are not large countries geographically, they are not large countries demographically, but they've been able to maintain their identity to the point where they are actually indispensable within the European Union because of what they contribute to the European Union. This is what I would expect for, for Africa, that we from very early uh, learn to appreciate one another. Professor Mugambi is um, one more question from Marcela Obade. Mm -hmm. It says, how should those of us who are of African descent, who are educators abroad, engage effectively in dialogue about decolonizing the African identity with our students and even colleagues without seeming defensive? Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, that, that question uh, very much and, and the concern. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I am very particular and uh, concerned about the verbs, the adjectives and the nouns, uh, the nouns that we use. Um, I think from the, uh, the beginning from your, your concern, I don't think that uh, decolonizing is, uh, is a positive verb. Um, because as long as colonizing is still there, when you decolonize, you, the colony is still there. Decolonize does not mean liberate. And uh, if you have perhaps uh, looked at my, my, my CV, you see my, my, my concern about movement from liberation to reconstruction. Um, and uh, it has been associated very much with me for several decades now. I suggested that those who are oppressed uh, should uh, stop, should move to another level, uh, and that is to, to, to be liberated or to liberate themselves. And the way to do that, in my view, you're asking how, how this can be, can, be, uh, can be helped, is uh, perhaps more interaction between those who are in various di diasporas and those who are here and also keeping, um, keeping um, a, a, a updated with the, the, the changes and the concerns that are happening in our respective countries in Africa, while those who are abroad also inform us about what is happening there. Part of the challenge we have in, in, in this continent is that those of us who are in the diaspora of course, to survive, have to, uh, to appreciate and, uh, and integrate with those societies. But I would wish that there was more uh, uh, inflow, more sharing about the dynamics of those societies so that we who are in the continent here can, uh, can learn about the nuances, the nuances, the intricacies of the dynamics there. We are discussing this at, uh, at, at the time of our, of, our, of our general election. And I have followed, I've been following very closely about the inner dynamics out there. I had thought that those countries that are developed were actually really democratic and they were actually doing things the right way. It turns out politics is politics irrespective of where, of, of where we are. And if statesmanship does not take priority, over politics, uh, we are going nowhere. In my view, there's a clear distinction between statesmanship and politics. And most of those who want leadership are not statesmen and stateswomen, they are politicians. And politicians think with their stomachs, not with their brains or their hearts. Other question is from Paul as well. 
is talking about the use of local languages in early years. Yes. Uh, that gives uh, the learners an opportunity to know their environment in the easiest and most um, most available, most easier way of self-expression. Um, so he's wondering, can we take can we take it further to the whole of Africa? What are the hindrances of this approach, Africa-wise? Yes. Um, once again. Uh, the human being is, is a very, very interesting mammal. It's amazing what the human brain can, uh, can accommodate. And if I refer again to the uh, Scandinavian countries and how they have managed to fit within the European Union, the, the Scandinavians are not just bilingual, trilingual. Most of them actually speak more than more than two or three languages. And they start that from very early. Children are, are very, very, very accommodative of ideas and, and skills. So my proposal would be not even bilinguality, not even trilinguality, but it is uh, making it possible for Africans to appreciate our diversity uh, which is our strength and not our weakness. In, if we take Kenya, for, for, for example, most of the youth now are, are not, uh, if they've gone to school, of course they'll have English, they'll have Kiswahili, but there is a risk among the children of the elite that they lose the, the, the language of their parents. And sometimes there's a worry where parents, uh, the, the parents of these children maybe from different uh, language groups. I don't think that should be a problem because if there is a, a, a will for the children to, to um, have competence in, in those languages, proficiency in those languages, they will actually pick them. Closing the, 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 the mind of the children and locking them into foreign languages is actually doing damage to, to, to them because they lose a heritage that is very vital to their own existence. Um, it is uh, being multilingual is much better than being monolingual. And I think this is the path we should be, we, we should be pursuing. It should not be one of bilinguality or trilinguality, but multilinguality. And uh, this I think is the way Africa should go. This is certainly a very engaging topic, and we thank Professor Mugambi and Professor Rory for indulging us today. Thank you for taking time to join us, our audience. We hope you found this series as fascinating as we have. We hope you can join us again for more engaging and intriguing and educative programs. Please subscribe to our mailing list by visiting our Contact Us page on our website globalcenters.colombia.edu forward slash Nairobi. We wish you a good day and or evening ahead. <laughs> we are sad to have to end at this point because our time is far gone. Okay, goodbye. Bye.